Welcome to Sonata Secrets and this video about Mozart's Fantasy in D minor. It is a great piece and quite accessible to play on an intermediate level. And it starts quite like the Moonlight Sonata by Beethoven with nice rolling arpeggios. So this is a fantasy or fantasia, either one of those, which means it's a freer form, kind of a collection of different ideas and themes put together in a form that's not as strict as the usual sonata form that were common at the time. But this piece is a little bit more unusual in another way that it's quite dark. Uh, so I mentioned Beethoven Moonlight Sonata and it shares the same character of really heavy and sad and it grows into uh, worry and despair at times. That's the first part of the piece. And then the second part, it's the perfect opposite of that. It just flips the switch and then it's D major and ends the piece as a happy aria. Then there's an interesting controversy about the ending, that it's actually not Mozart who has written the ending that's printed in the version. I'll get to that later in the video. For now, let's go through the music. So the first thing is about tempo. Andante is slow and walking, but the time signature, in most editions it's common time. But I've also seen editions where it's cut time. So if you feel it as cut time, two beats per bar, you can end up with a much faster tempo. And some pianists play it like that, for example, Friedrich Golda. So if you feel it in cut time, two beats per bar in Andante. So Andante, but two beats. That's like an extreme version and it's not very common, but it's possible to interpret it if you have a ver edition with cut time. But I stick to the more traditional common time feeling of four beats per bar and andante, so something like this. It's so nice chords, very pianistically written, just rolling the hands over the chords. And I'm gonna go through the harmonic function of these chords because they're very pure. It's just the chord that's laying out there. So D minor here. Now. This is G minor with a six. The E is the six. So it's a D minor is the subdominant minor and the six on the subdominant minor gives it this really uh, sad and tension chord. Setting the tone for the whole piece. And now... This is D major 7th with the 7th in the bass. So we're kind of uh, pointing to a new direction here with switching from D minor to D major with the 7th. So it's pointing towards the next chord which is G minor. So it's acting as an intermediate dominant, this D seventh. And it's always a great thing to have the seventh in the bass, really showing like something more is going on this. And now the G minor. And now we have these painful suspensions on top. Kind of a melodic fragment. And it's a sequence, now where it's a quicker harmonic pace of only a half bar. It's G minor, F major. This is the third in D minor. Something is going on here. And then a normal diminished chord, kind of capitalizing on the tension. With this suspension, which is very much out there. It's not part of the diminished chord in suspension, finally resolving to A major, which is the dominant to D minor, and a cool arabesque here on top.
just going through some of the neighbor notes. And we're finishing deep on the A. And it's a fermata. And now we start kind of the piece is starting the real piece with a main theme. Uh, so now it's adagio, it's supposed to be slower. And we get this amazing, lovely theme, sad and painful. So it's always like this in Mozart. It's a perfect balance and symmetry with phrases often. So here we have a clear, the first phrase is like a statement. Now I'm playing it faster for, um, uh, to make a point. It's a statement. And then the second phrase is almost exactly the same, but different in the end. So it's like an answer to that. And especially the last, uh, just the direction of the melody in the end. It's like an infliction in the voice. If you say something like a question, uh, I say something, it's the first one. And then I say something is going down again. We can also see all these chromatic notes uh, emphasizing the pain in the music. something new a lot of tension uh, and that's like one statement and now a reaction this is like uh, unsecure and searching maybe landing on a hopeful note there uh, we have the, the chromaticism here as well This is so fun to play. Now for the next part, we get a new theme and I will call this the fate theme because it's very, it's insisting on this one note. And resolving to E major, uh, we get this chromatic descent in the bass and the chords just following, really don't know where it's going until here maybe. So we get the E in the bass and this is a suspension on the, on the beat, resolving. And now all this, it's been, the character has been so far sad and a little bit of painful. And now the section that comes now, we start to get some movement and there's some agency here. It's like a big worry that grows into despair. And the tempo relations here are, I find it hard to keep a slow tempo. If you take too slow a tempo in the adagio, for example, if you do. In that tempo, this section is supposed to be. I find that it's like too slow because it's so much going on this syncopation there's a force driving forward so um, it's hard to combine these tempo relations I kind of split the difference I don't take as heavy a tempo in the adagio but then I also go forward a little bit here so we get something like this Now the growing starts. Again. And it's a big surprise when the break comes. You think it will go somewhere and then it's just, oh, wow, what's, what's that about? And one point about this, all the notes should be very short, I think, like to give it a lot of energy. Not. Okay, after this we get a fermata again and then we start over with the main theme, but now in A minor. So it's kind of in a different key, 
not the D minor, that's the, the tonality, so we get. So now this second phrase, that what was the answer the first time, this is something different now. So we're going in a new direction and it's we're landing on this diminished chord. There's a lot of tension. Another diminished chord. A growing. And now we get a new section which is presto. So this is going back to the fantasy element. Uh, a big cadenza, a flurry of notes. Fermata again, and now the fate theme again, but in a different key, starting on a D instead of an E. But we recognize it, and now we know what's going to come. It's time for movement again. One point here, the suspension. Uh, it's a diminished chord with a suspension. And uh, this one. We actually have this in the beginning uh, when we get to. It's the same kind of suspensions uh, in a completely different setting. So back to this place. over but now so this second time it grows kind of out of proportion a lot of chromatic really cool place uh, place for practicing a lot and then we get another one of these uh, cadential presto and going upward Back to the main theme in D minor. So this is kind of the recapitulation of the first part of the fantasy. It's such a great feeling to play this chromatic scale just seamlessly going into the theme. So you obviously start fast and then slowing down. Okay, now after this outburst, it feels it's the Beethoven element, uh, what we, <laughs> I always tend to call it a Beethovenian uh, outburst, but it's present in Mozart before Beethoven, so. Response. But now. So this takes a new direction here and after all this pain and frustration and anguish and despair we finally get some hope here on this very nice chord. And it's a lot about the, the pauses in between. So E flat major, this is the Neapolitan again but it's preceded by the B flat major. So we don't get the Neapolitan effect of a sudden new chord, but it's still there. And now a final echo of the dramatic uh, things. But then cadential chords here. Just going back to D minor, a 6-4 chord, a dominant chord. And now the second part of the fancy is about to start and here is the flip to D major and we get completely new music. It's like an aria in a Mozart opera. Uh, very clear melodic uh, singing line on the right hand, so... Very uh, 
<laughs> happy-go-lucky type of melody. So we have this short repeat here of eight bars and what happens with this short repeat, it's really significant for the musical structure. It means completely different things. When you, so after we've had the first time it's a statement, when we get the repeat, it turns into an answer with the same statement, but as an answer, it's really cool. So this is the first time. Uh, it's an answer. There's a really cool thing I listened to Alfred Brendel when he played this and when he got here in the repeats he did this. I mean why not? Now uh, we move on we have a, a developing thing here a second second phrase with the repeat. Then we go on and we add now even more energy with the left hand. So if you notice it's actually a repeat but it's not uh, repeat signs, it's written out because it changes in the end from a, a statement to an answer. So we get uh, and here starts like the final cadence, we're on a D major 6-4 chord and here we get another one of these uh, cadenzas with the right hand but it's more traditional. The previous ones are really kind of out there in just a big movement of notes. This is more clear with the trill and everything. the dominant seven and it's the same thing here as in the chromatic scale we're gradually going back into the eighth notes and the theme but now it's more triumphant in the end so this is a repeat of the first theme uh, as I'm sure you heard so we get it as a kind of recapitulation after this cadence and uh, yeah. And here is where the ending controversy begins. So this ending that's written in, in uh, all, almost all the scores, uh, sometimes with a note that it's, it's uh, something about the ending. I will play it now so you get the traditional ending that is the one that has been published. It goes like this. It's a little bit suspicious that it's pianissimo and fortissimo in this ending while the rest of the piece, the only dynamic range is piano and forte. Even with all the outbursts uh, and the cadenzas, it's only forte. Suddenly it's pianissimo and fortissimo. A little bit suspicious, I think. So, in the first edition of this piece, published in Vienna in 1804, the piece ended after this bar with an A7th chord. But two years after that, in 1806, it was published by Breitkopf and Hertel in Leipzig. And then it included this ending that has been with the piece ever since. So for a long time, everyone thought that this was the proper ending. But in 1944, the scholar Paul Hirsch uh, kind of discovered that there was a discrepancy with the ending with the first edition and the subsequent editions. So in an article, The Mozart Problem, Paul Hirsch suggests that the ending was written by August Eberhard Müller. Uh, Hirsch writes that the cantor of St. Thomas Church, August Eberhard Müller, was an intimate friend of Gottfried Christoph Herzl and he was doubtless concerned in the edition of the Mozart oeuvre and had at the time produced a series of vocal scores for Mozart's operas. So he was clearly kind of involved in the edition of Mozart music. So Paul Hurst suggests that he wrote the ending for Breitkopf and Hartel, so they pu can publish it in 1806 to, with a proper ending of a piece. 
like the theory is that maybe Mozart wanted to write the fantasy as one part of a bigger work and then maybe a fugue or uh, some other he wrote a fantasy preceding a sonata in C minor uh, so maybe it was something like that but whatever uh, might have been thought to have come after it haven't survived so we can never know about that but that might be a theory of why it ended there when Mozart wrote it but it's basically not really a controversy it's pretty clear that this ending is not by Mozart but now it gets really interesting because the pianist Mitsuku Ushida quite of a big Mozart scholar she's recorded a lot of his works on piano when she plays it she just plays a different ending altogether she goes back to the introduction and play those arpeggios so like if Mozart didn't write this ending why should we play this ending that's in the score I think most pianists still play this ending that is thought to be by Miller but I think there's some room for freedom here like if you want to go back and play the introduction it's kind of acceptable to do that so as a finishing part of this video I will play Ushida's ending that she plays mm -hmm. 